Welcome, I'm really glad you've been able to find this and I hope it will be helpful as we spend some time reflecting on the life of Susanna Wesley. thought we'd do something a little bit different this week as a church and as mentioned on Sunday, next week we'll be looking at biblical womanhood. And so just as something different to do together, I thought looking at the life of Susanna Wesley uh, may be a helpful reflection for us. Uh, Susanna is, is best known as the mother of John and Charles Wesley, who had an incredible influence and impact upon Christianity in this country. And um, in many ways, God used them to transform uh, the landscape of uh, Christianity in England uh, over the generations that would follow. Uh, John Wesley is, of course, the founder, father of the Methodist movement. Uh, well known as a great preacher and evangelist and minister and Charles Wesley has greatly impacted Christianity in this country through the hymns and poems he wrote around about something like 9,000 Christian poems many of which have been made into very famous hymns that have impacted the uh, generations since and greatly inspired Christians in their worship of God. And probably the most significant impact on the lives of those two very influential men, John and Charles Wesley, one of the great role models in their lives was their mother, Susanna. In reading about Susanna, uh, I hope we'll be challenged about the legacy that we leave to the generations that come after us, warning us about some of the dangers of the bad role models that uh, potentially we have, as John and Charles had some um, quite disastrous role models in their lives as well. And hopefully we'll be inspired by the life that Susanna lived through the incredible challenges that she had to endure in her life. We're going to start by reading from Proverbs 31, which is that famous account of the, the woman or the wife of noble character written in Proverbs 31 verse 10. Let me just read some of these verses to you and then we'll think about some of these characteristics as displayed in Susanna Wesley's life and how that becomes something of a challenge to how we show these characteristics, particularly uh, for the uh, Christian women in our church as to how they might best display these characteristics for the glory of God. So Proverbs 31 says, A wife of noble character who can find she is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously, her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed with scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them, and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, T praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive. Beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honour her for all her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. There is a saying that having a child makes you a parent. Having two children makes you a referee, and having more than two children makes you crowd control. Well, Susanna Wesley had 19 children, so I don't know what that makes her, 
but by her parents' standards, that would have been considered quite a small family. Susanna's parents had 25 children. As one author put it, her parents had a quarter of a hundred children. Susanna was the 25th of those 25 children, born in 1669, so the middle of the 17th century. Let's say something about Susanna's background, um, something about her parents, which may uh, help us understand something about her life as well. Susanna's father was Dr. Samuel Ansley or Ainsley. Um, it was, uh, to some extent, unfortunate that her father was called Samuel because her husband would also be called Samuel, as would her firstborn son, as would her brother as well. And so in every direction of her family tree, she had Samuels, which can get a little bit confusing. Samuel, her father, was a very well-known man and a very well thought of man, quite influential in the particular um, part of the church in which he served. The family had many well-known visitors to the house because of Samuel's influence. So many famous names, including the author Daniel Defoe, who's the writer of, um, of Robinson Crusoe. Father Samuel was a minister. Uh, the family moved to Kent where Samuel began to pastor a church there. The previous pastor had um, um, got up to no good really and was relieved of his duties. He had promoted a lot of sort of drunken behaviour and drunken celebrations with his congregation and when Samuel took up the pastorate and decided to put a stop to that kind of behaviour he received death threats as a result. Such was the state of um, some parts of the church at that time. Samuel was no coward, and in the face of these death threats, in the face of a number of other struggles he faced, he proved that he was no coward. See, at that time, Parliament passed what was known as the Act of Uniformity. The law commanded all Christians to conform to the, the ways of worship of the Church of England. And if you know much about the history of that time, you'll know that there were great, um, significant political and spiritual reasons why many Christians felt they couldn't conform to the ways the Church of England were doing things to the state church. Um, a very different time to the, to the times we live in now. But if you know some of the complexities of, of the history of, of uh, the various churches in those days, you perhaps understand something of that. We don't have time to go into those now. But Samuel, along with other non-Anglican ministers, was forbidden to preach as a result. But he, with 2,000 other pastors, refused to conform. And by doing so, he risked a heavy fine. He even risked imprisonment and slavery. The authorities tried to have Samuel put in prison. However, uh, they failed on numerous occasions. In fact, on one occasion, the official signing Samuel's arrest warrant suddenly dropped down dead in the act of signing it. After 10 years, these laws were relaxed. A new king came to the throne and Samuel began upping his preaching responsibilities, preaching two or three times a day and therefore 15 or 20 times a week. He was a devoted man, a hard working man, having committed himself to reading 20 chapters of the Bible every day since the age of five until the end of his life. And this level of devotion was passed on to his 25th child, Susanna. She committed herself as a child never to spend more time in hobbies, more time in relaxation than she spent in Bible study and in prayer. However, Susanna, while being very much like her father in many ways, was also very different in others. As a 13-year-old girl, she decided to leave her father's church and join the Church of England. This was not a decision she took lightly. Susanna actually wrote at the age of perhaps 12, she wrote a history of the controversies that were going on in the Church of England and the controversies in Christianity in England at that time. And she wrote a great history of, um, of the points that are being put forward by the Anglican Church and the points that are being put forward countering by the what were called the dissenters, those who were not conforming. 
to the Church of England so that she could weigh up um, the various pros and cons of uh, each of the arguments. Uh, she wrote a great history of it and um, she read the best of what both sides had to offer and weighed up their arguments. This was at the age of 12 or 13 at the most. Clearly a very bright child. As you can imagine, this um, decision to return to the Church of England did not go down well with her parents who had suffered much because of their decision to split from the state church. But this shows a number of things about Susanna. It shows she was incredibly strong-minded and any biography you read of Susanna Wesley will um, demonstrate how strong-minded she was, how thoughtful she was, a woman of great convictions and a woman of great courage. Just say something about her marriage. Uh, Susanna was 19 when she married again another Samuel, Samuel Wesley. She became Susanna Wesley at the age of 19. Uh, Samuel was uh, in his uh, mid-twenties when they got married. He was a man of very short stature, only five foot four, um, quite short in comparison to his quite tall wife, Susanna. He was a, from a similar background as Susanna. Samuel's father uh, was also forbidden to preach by the authorities, which he also resisted, very much like Susanna's father which led him to being imprisoned four times throughout his life, finally dying in jail at the age of 42. And so they had a number of things in common as husband and wife, particularly in terms of their backgrounds. Like both their fathers, uh, Samuel himself, Samuel Wesley, became a minister. And as we go through their story, it will become clear that... Uh, Samuel, in many ways, was completely unsuitable to be a pastor. Uh, this was a time of great spirituality in many parts of the church and tremendous compromise in other parts of the church. And sadly, Samuel seemed to go into ministry for some mixed motivations. He went into ministry, it seems, perhaps for the sense of importance and status enjoying that position as the local vic vicar which um, in some sense treated you as the sort of local town celebrity and um, although Samuel had a number of great qualities a very intelligent man a brilliant man in many ways um, a man who was honoured by his wife for his great intellect and intelligence yet a man of um, uh, great troubles and problems as well, a real mixed bag. Having said that he went into the ministry to be something of a celebrity, perhaps, he certainly wasn't paid like a celebrity. Uh, Samuel Wesley earned £28 a year in his first pastorate. They did move on um, and he was paid more throughout his life. But in his first pastorate, he was paid just £28 a year, which of course £28 was a lot more then than it was now but it certainly wasn't enough to be able to pay the bills. Uh, for example, Susanna's father, Samuel, in uh, his job as a pastor, received £700 a year, obviously um, showing that £28 wasn't much at all. They lived in poverty all their lives, did Samuel and Susanna, and uh, S uh, Samuel wasn't very good with money at all. In fact, he was known for his problems getting into debt. He was known for his money problems, the debt that he couldn't pay off all of his life. For much of his life, he couldn't support his family and couldn't support his wife, Susanna. He made enemies and he made trouble for himself as a result of the debt he incurred and uh, at times brought great disgrace on himself and on his family and on his church as well. In fact, there were incidents of mobs, violent mobs surrounding his house and death threats that he received as a result of some of the... Um, trouble he got into. It was well known that Samuel had problems with debt. In fact, one of the men who worked in Samuel's church would often preach when Samuel was, was away. And um, it became quite obvious that he was always preaching on how terrible it was for a man to get himself into debt. This obviously annoyed Susanna that this man was clearly using his opportunities to preach, essentially to make trouble for her husband. And that didn't seem to be an appropriate use of the pulpit. Uh, 
and uh, we might guess that he was trying to get Samuel kicked out of the church so that perhaps he could take over. So whenever Samuel was away, Susanna would open up her own kitchen and hold meetings there for the family and for friends and for the local community to gather. She would find a book of sermons and she'd read one of the sermons to the people who gathered in the kitchen. Um, as many as 200 people at one time would gather. Um, the kitchen was overflowing with people not content to go to the local church where they'd hear this curate rant and rave about Samuel's debts. They wanted to hear about Jesus. They wanted to hear about the gospel, which Susanna did in uh, their own house. When Samuel returned home, he would often find that his church had grown as a result, in large part to Susanna's efforts in stirring up the hearts of people with an appetite to hear about Jesus. Samuel also did a lot of writing. He spent most of his married life working on a commentary of the book of Job, anything up to 25 years. He worked on writing this commentary in Latin, which he never finished. He also wrote for a local magazine, answering Bible questions, sort of difficult Bible questions that people would write in uh, from the readers, such as, on what day of the week did Adam and Eve sin? Uh, how do angels eat? And other sort of nonsense Bible questions like that, if you like. Samuel also spent a lot of time writing poetry. In fact, he published a book of poetry called Maggots. Uh, the poems inside it had equally strange titles, things like um, A Snake in a Box of Bran, a poem entitled The Grunting of a Hog, or To My Gingerbread Mistress, The Barefaced Lady, and A Box Like an Egg. He also wrote poems about his wife, thankfully a little more romantic than those uh, poems sounded. He wrote this poem. He said she, and perhaps the words of this poem uh, give us a little insight into what their marriage was like and the kind of responsibilities he thought he had as a husband. He wrote this. She graced my humble roof and blessed my life, blessed me by a far greater name than wife. Yet still I bore an undisputed sway, nor was it her task but her pleasure to obey. Nor did I for her care ungrateful prove, but only used my power to show my love. Whenever she asked, I gave without reproach or judge, for still she reason asked, and I was judge. From those lines, we perhaps get a little sense of what a mixed bag their marriage was. He speaks of his great love for his wife, their care and compassion for each other. And yet you get a sense there of the harshness, perhaps of um, the way he treated her, the strictness. Um, he essentially says, I, I loved her a lot, uh, but I was still the boss and I made sure that what I said happened. Uh, he ruled with a firm hand. He could, and I say he was an incredibly mixed bag. Um, he could be incredibly sensitive and compassionate and romantic, yet he could be incredibly irresponsible, rash, and quite honestly stupid, sometimes unbearably so. Uh, one particular e incident in their life stands out that one evening during uh, supper, uh, Samuel prayed as of course was their, um, uh, their habit to pray before dinner. He prayed for the King of England, William of Orange. Now you may know that at that time there was a dispute between, um, within uh, the royal family, within the monarchy. There was a dispute between who was the rightful King of England. Was it William of Orange or was it James II? Now Susanna, as many people did, supported James. And Samuel, as many others did, supported William of Orange. And so when her husband over dinner prayed for King William, Susanna refused to say Amen at the end of the prayer. And Samuel responded by saying, if England must have two kings, then we must have two beds. He told Susanna that she would never see him again because, he refu because she refused to say Amen to a prayer for the King of England. And he left in a fit of rage, hurling down curses upon his wife and his children. I said he was a mixed bag, and that's perhaps an understatement. 
So he left his wife, he left for um, London, and uh, soon after he left, Susanna's house caught fire with the children inside. She was quite sick at the time, as often she was throughout her life, so she ran throughout the house in um, quite an unfit state, looking for her children, managed to pick up one under each arm and ran through the smoke and flames, carrying her children to safety. Samuel by now had reached the outskirts of London when news of this fire back home had reached him. He wondered if it was the result of the, uh, of the curses that he had brought down on his wife and his children and quickly borrowed a horse and rode back to his family home. He later wrote that when he arrived home, my wife, my children and my books were saved. He at least put his books last of the three in that order, but the very fact that he included his books being saved along with his children and his wife perhaps tells you all you need to know. Samuel did stay with Susanna uh, for a time afterwards. Um, they lived together as their home was being rebuilt and their children, some of them at least, spent time elsewhere with family members uh, while the damage of the fire was undone. Only then for him to keep his foolish promise to leave her and um, once things were back to normal, he left his wife for five months um, for her to tend to the children alone. Not that he mu did much of parenting when he was there. After that, he did return and tried to undo some of the damage and they did live together, although um, somewhat at a distance, somewhat as strange as from then on in, as you can perhaps sympathise. Uh, Susanna, for her part, kept her dignity intact. For all of the misgivings and um, stupidity of her husband, she remained faithful and she remained compassionate towards him and devoted towards him, um, realising that he was not fulfilling the duties of a husband, but nevertheless decided that she would fill the duties of a wife. She never abandoned her responsibilities and she remained faithful to um, Samuel for all his shocking behaviour. Something that God says of himself in 2 Timothy chapter 2, God says, when we are faithless, God remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. We see that divine faithfulness reflected in Susanna, remaining faithful amid the faithlessness of her husband. To say something about her children, and you say quite a lot about her children, and we'll get an insight into her life by looking at her children somewhat, and her role as mother, which was such an impactful role in the generations that would follow. In, so into this life of poverty, into this roller coaster of a marriage, they had children. They had their first son, Samuel. I'm going to say quite a confusing um, to call him Samuel uh, with all the Samuels in their family. And so they did call him Sammy. Uh, their first child, their first son, Sammy. Soon after that, they had their second child and first daughter, Susanna. Uh, families did like to um, uh, keep names in the family. And so their first son and first daughter were also called Susanna and Samuel. But tragedy soon struck their families, as, as often it did, struck many families in those days. Baby Susanna, their first daughter, became unwell and soon passed away. It was not unusual for children to die in childbirth or in infancy or before they reached adulthood which is why parents often had so many children, why the Wesleys had 19 children. I mentioned they had 19, but uh, that is potentially misleading to say they had 19 children because 10 of those 19 did indeed pass away in either childbirth or in infancy. As one author put it, much of Susanna's life was taken up with watching her own children die. It's quite a a painful life, a life of agony. We know that our own Saviour Jesus was described as a man of sorrows. He's a man who endured much. And Susanna, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of her family, for the sake of the calling of motherhood that God had put on her life, she became a woman of great sorrows. A few years later, Susanna's father also died, and to rub salt into the wounds, her father shared out the inheritance amongst all of his sons and daughters, except for Susanna. She was left out of the will, and so a family struggling to cope with poverty and death 
was given no relief. Susanna devoted herself to educating her children, having not received a proper education herself in the way that many uh, would have received an education. In those days, women were not allowed to go to university. So while some of her brothers may have gone to university, she would not have done. She made sure that her children would receive an education and that her daughters especially would receive an education. So Susanna learned French. She learned Latin and Greek. So she spoke four different languages. She studied philosophy and logic and became, and became um, adept in both of those subjects as well. Even as a teenager, we saw how bright she was writing that history of the disputes between various Christians so that she could make informed decisions and that she could work through the various argumentation and come to conclusions for herself. Very wise thing to do. As an adult, she wrote an exposition on the Apostles' Creed, um, assessing each point of the famous Apostles' Creed and explaining each point of Christian doctrine in her own words. She wrote a handbook of Christian doctrine for each of her children, evidence how bright she was, how intellectual she was. And we can see from the letters she wrote that she had a great grasp of, um, of the great truths and storylines of the Bible. For example, in uh, one of the letters she wrote to her children, this is not in one of the books she wrote, but just in one of the letters she uh, frequently wrote to the children, she said this, Jesus sustained the whole weight of grief and sorrow, which was due to the justice of God for the sins of the world. He was betrayed by one man, denied by another, and forsaken by all. Through the physical pains brought on by the crown of thorns, by the scourging, by the piercing of his nerves, of his most sacred body, those pains brought on an inexpressible torture, yet they were infinitely surpassed by the anguish of his soul, which caused that loud and impassioned cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he who could not die except by a voluntary act of surrendering his life, he gave up his pure and spotless life into the hands of his almighty father. It's an incredible grasp of, um, of what the Bible had to say. Susanna set up a school in her own home for her uh, children, as she had sort of a, enough for a class of children. She committed to teaching them for six hours a day for six days a week, from Monday through Saturday. She taught from nine till 12 and then from two till five. And in addition to that, she gave each one of her 10 children personal and private tuition for at least one hour every week. So that's something like eight hours a day for six hours a week teaching, for six days a week teaching. So it wasn't purely academic teaching. Uh, the personal tuition that she gave her children was in part to check up on their spiritual health and see how their prayer lives were going, see how their personal growth was going and to see how their Bible study was going as well. Susanna realised that it was more than just about learning about the Bible, more than just learning about God, that that wasn't enough. It was more important to know God personally. And so she wrote to one of her daughters, Suki, she wrote, you've learned prayers and creeds and learned of your duty to God and to your neighbour. But Suki, it is not enough to learn these things by heart. It is not enough to say a few prayers in the morning and evening. That alone will not bring you to heaven. It is in practising, in, ex in experiencing these things that you know. How did she have strength to do so much for her children? How did she have strength to teach for eight hours a day, six days a week? Well, she began each day with one hour of prayer uh, before she began her duties as a teacher and a mother, asking God to give her the strength to raise her children, seeing it as a God-given calling upon her life to motherhood, that she would serve as God had, gave, God had given her opportunities. Undoubtedly, Susanna was a strong woman. As you read through the account of her life, she's clearly a very strong woman, strong will, strong minded and strong um, physically, despite her many illnesses. Deeply committed, deeply uh, resolute woman, often quite stubborn and independent. Um, yet she sought through all of her physical and mental strength. She still sought strength from the Lord to be able to carry out the tasks that God had given to her.
Susanna came up with 12, sorry, with um, uh, 16 rules for raising children, 16 rules for motherhood. They include things like this. No snacks for your children between meals. No complaining when taking medicine. Never give anything your children moan for. Only what they ask for politely. A lot of wisdom in some of these things. Uh, prevent your child from, to prevent a child from lying, you should never punish them for something that they have freely confessed and repented of first. So he said, look, if, if you encourage repentance and encourage confession by not punishing the things that they've repented of, then they won't be tempted to lie about what they've done wrong. They'll be encouraged to see repentance and confession as something that they should do. She said, never go, never let sin go unpunished. So when a child doesn't confess and repent of their sin, make sure that they get punished for that. Make sure there's consequences for sin, but always reward good behaviour. Always reinforce good behaviour. Never punish a child for the same offence twice, she said. Never hold a grudge against them in that way for things they've done wrong in the past. Always make sure that when someone's when there's been consequences for things that they've done, that then it's done and dusted with and you can carry on and there's forgiveness and grace shown as a result. Any attempt to do good, no matter how poorly done it is, should be rewarded. Teach a child to pray from a young age. And lastly, uh, to send any daughter off to work, you must ensure you've taught them to read first. As in that society, many daughters would have gone off to work and would have not have been given the basic skills of reading and writing before they'd done so. Not had the benefits and privileges of education that the sons would have received in a family. Uh, Susanna made sure that all of her daughters were uh, taught to read and write before they were sent off to work, made sure they had the basic skills that they needed that the sons would have received as well. Susanna ran her home like a, a well-oiled machine, receiving very little help from Samuel, her husband. Uh, it was said that the sound of children crying was never heard in the Wesley's house. Such was uh, the way that Susanna ran things. Now, of course, all of these things are great, but they don't make you a Christian. And here's one of the dangers when looking at someone like Susanna Wesley. There's a danger that we judge somebody's faith by their works. Now, the Bible does, of course, remind us that good trees produce good fruit and that true faith in God must produce fruit. Of course, the book of James reminds of this so powerfully where James says, look, if you have faith, true saving faith, it must result in works. And if you've got no works, it proves you have dead faith. But there is a danger when we look at people like Susanna Wesley, that because they were so strong and gifted and capable, that we tend, people like that can fall into the danger of tending to want to earn their salvation and uh, to um, earn favour with God through good works, to earn their salvation through being good people. Her son John, John Wesley, was very concerned that her mother was guilty of this. In fact, he suspected that she wasn't actually a true Christian until much, much later on in life, that she hadn't really understood the, the great truths of the gospel until her old age. Um, she didn't seem to grasp some of the truths of the gospel fully, that we are saved completely by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ, until she was older. That we're not saved by works, we're not saved by achieving our salvation, but by faith in Christ who achieved it for us on our behalf. There's a mixture of evidence for and against this in Susanna's life when you read through the things that she wrote, which is quite a lot. Sometimes when Susanna wrote, it sounds like she believed she was trying to earn her salvation. And sometimes it seems like she understood that she could only be saved through God's grace and through faith in Jesus. Ultimately, it's really hard to say. Of course, only God knows. We do need to understand the gospel to be saved. That's very clear from the Bible. And yet it's also important to say that it's not perfect theology that saves us. It's not a perfect knowledge of everything and having all of our 
I's dotted and T's crossed to be able to be saved. Um, many people are saved, or we're all saved, by really by a simple faith in the Saviour, Jesus. Certainly in old age, she did grasp um, truly what it meant to be saved by faith in such a way that it gave her an assurance of her faith that she perhaps didn't have early on in life. There was an instant where taking communion one day in later life, she said she was struck to the heart that God in Christ had saved her from all of her sins. And John Wesley thought that was the moment where she truly became a Christian. Now, everyone leaves a legacy as a Christian. Susanna raised seven daughters and three sons. And Susanna's legacy is seen very much in the children that she raised. They were smart children. They were strong. They were capable. Many of them were very godly children. Many of them had great influence on their community and served God in great ways and served in their community uh, with the gifts that God had given to them. However, at the same time, they could not escape the legacy of their father. Almost all of their children had bad marriages. It seems easy to blame Samuel, their father, for the bad marriages they had. But each, each person, of course, must be responsible for their own actions. And yet each of us needs to think about the legacy that we are leaving and the impact that we are leaving on those around us. Not all of us will be called to be fathers or mothers. Not all of us will be called to be husbands and wives, but we will all impact those around us. We will all impact those who are younger than us, who look up to us in whatever roles God has called us to, whether in the church, in our community, in our workplace, or in our families and marriages. For example, um, in terms of the marriages that uh, Samuel and Susanna's children has, we see the legacy of their bad marriage um, very much affecting the children that came after them. For example, Susanna's daughter Amelia fell in love several times, only for the men she fell in love with to be quite unsuitable. And in desperation, in trying to find a husband, uh, she married a man who was described as heartless, a man who made her life quite miserable. Another daughter, Suki, uh, had received a promise from a man uh, promising to look after her, a man who was in India and said when he returned, he would look after uh, Suki. He came home and broke his promise and Suki therefore turned to a man named Richard Ellison to be her husband. Now, Susanna Wesley wrote about this man, Richard Ellison, said he was inferior to the demons in terms of wickedness. He was a vile man. And Suki ended up running for her life from her husband, taking her children and running from the home, escaping uh, to London for safety. Richard, her husband, was so twisted that he faked his own death in the hopes that Suki might return to their home thinking that he was dead. In fact, she did return. She returned home for his funeral, only to find him alive. As it happens, through Susanna's son, John, Richard Ellison, this wicked, vile, twisted man was actually saved in old age. He was convicted of his sin and he went through great agony uh, for a whole week as he came to terms with the sin that he committed and repented, confessed and came to Jesus. John Wesley himself, um, that great figure of the 17th and um, 18th century, uh, was well known for his bad marriage. He's well known for his poor decisions himself in marriage and uh, the awful treatment of uh, that his wife committed against him. Uh, the only one of his children... Well, there was Charles Wesley as well, who seemed to have a very successful marriage. But the only one of his daughters, um, of Susanna's daughters, who seemed to have a good marriage was uh, her, her daughter, uh, Mary. Mary was crippled by an accident early on in her life, and she wondered if anyone could ever love her. She fell in love with a good, honest man, just an ordinary working class man, um, a DIY man who served in their village, a man called John. John and Mary were married. And they enjoyed a happy and joyful marriage until tragically Mary died giving birth to one of their uh, first children. One of Susanna's daughters, their fifth daughter, was named Mehatabal. 
not the prettiest of names to give a daughter, and so the name was shortened to Hetty. Hetty, like her mother, was very bright, very capable, very strong-minded, and by the age of nine, Net uh, Hetty had already learned to read Greek and Latin. Um, added to this, she was a great poet. Um, some of her father's poetry, Samuel Wesley's poetry, was good. Some of it was not so good. Um, but Hetty, their daughter, was a great poet. One Christian book editor even called her a poetic genius. When Hetty grew up, uh, she, began, uh, she began to look for her husband in the village that they lived in, but she didn't find any man suitable. She was quite distressed at the lack of suitable men, the lack of strong men, the lack of courageous, honourable men, the lack of godly men. And so she wrote a, she wrote a, um, she wrote a poem um, about the potential boyfriends in the town. She wrote this poem to one of her sisters saying, look how unsuitable the men are here in Epworth where uh, they lived. This was the part of the poem. She said, fortune has fixed me in a place. You know, by chance, I'm in this particular place, a place debarred of wisdom, wit and grace. High births and virtue equally they scorn like donkeys dull on dunghills born. Saying there's no men of virtue here. There's no men who respects the respectable things in life. They are like donkeys born on a dunghill. After a few fallings out with her father, Hetty left home. They very much clashed over a number of things, only to return much later, five months pregnant. Um, yet still single, yet still unmarried. Uh, she returned home five months pregnant, which caused her family great upset. And her father was furious with her actions and with her uh, mistakes. He forced her, as a result, into marrying the first man who came along. It's a classic example of two wrongs don't make a right. So because she'd um, sadly got herself pregnant, um, he forced her into this marriage with this quite terrible man, really, a man by the name of William Wright, a man described as rude and rough, a godless man given to too much drink. Susanna had apparently said of this man that to imagine William and Hetty together makes her flesh creep. This was Samuel's way of punishing his daughter really for, um, for getting herself pregnant outside of marriage. All the rest of the family sided with Hetty. They understood that she'd made a mistake they realised the size of the mistake that she'd made and the problems that she caused herself, but they wanted to show her that Christ-like grace and forgiveness, recognising that she understood the mistake that she'd made. So next time John, um, Hetty's brother John, next time John had the chance to preach with her father in the congregation, he preached this message entitled, Showing Love to Sinners realising that her father wasn't showing the kind of love and grace that he should have shown to a father of Hetty, to the father of Hetty. One of Susanna's daughters, Mary, wrote to her father, in light of all these things that had gone on, saying, Father, you are a good man, but you're rarely a kind man. You're rarely a forgiving man. You are sometimes a tyrant to those you love. He was a good man at times with Samuel Wesley, and he did have many redeeming qualities, but he was an extreme case of being a mixed bag, from incredible um, love and kindness he could show at times, great um, romance and um, great intelligence to a man who could be quite tyrannical at times, which his uh, children saw the best and worst of him. And sadly, he left a legacy of the best and worst in his life. And therefore, we must all reflect on the kind of qualities that we are showing and the kind of qualities we're passing on to others. Susanna herself understood the grace of God in this. It took her a while to come to terms with what had happened with her daughter um, uh, becoming pregnant. Uh, but she saw that her daughter's repentance was sincere and she showed great compassion and mercy 
um, often that lacking in her husband. Hetty, however, went away from the Lord for many years. Her brother John said that of all the family, Hetty would be the least he would expect it to become a Christian. And yet much later in life, it turns out that Hetty began attending a church. In fact, she began attending John's church, her brother's church. And she was gloriously saved under John's preaching, under her brother's teaching. And in fact, she went to serve with John in the church to John's great surprise at the miracle of grace that God had performed in the life of his sister. It's hard for us to imagine, perhaps, the amount of sadness and distress and grief that Susanna experienced during her life. Many of us have experienced incredible grief as we do through life, incredible hardships and uh, struggles. But you think of some of the things that Susanna went through, disinherited by her parents, who at times refused to speak to her because of the split between the, uh, the churches that were taking place, abandoned by her husband, living in absolute poverty, living with the foolishness of her husband, having to raise 10 children by herself, seeing another nine children die in infancy, seeing her remaining children to experience some of the most tragic marriages, having their house burned down twice. In fact, throughout their lives, their house was burned down. Um, Charles Wesley had to, uh, uh, he escaped by the skin of his teeth uh, through the second, um, uh, the second burning down of their house they experienced having mobs of people come to their house because of her husband's bad decisions. Her husband later died, uh, having been thrown off a wagon on a journey down a hill, he fell headlong down the hill, leaving Susanna a, 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 a widow uh, for the rest of her life. Plus, of course, being incredibly ill herself um, through long periods of, um, of, of her own life. And yet through it all, through all of those struggles and through all of those hardships, she remained faithful. She persevered for the sake of her children, for the sake of her godly witness. She persevered through great strength and courage. At every point, she learned, uh, she, uh, so she leaned on the Lord for great strength so that through her life, she might leave a legacy of the strength that God can provide and the grace that God can provide through suffering. Despite the incredible loss, Susanna showed incredible trust in God. She wrote this once to her son Charles. She said, in truth, I have never had an anxious thought. This was after the death of her first son Samuel who um, I did I think did grow up to adulthood, but um, but died at a fairly young age. Um, she wrote to uh, uh, Charles about what she was feeling. She said, I've never had one anxious thought, for immediately, whenever I seem to have an anxious thought, it comes to my mind that God has called me to a deeper dependence upon himself. That's not to say she didn't grieve. That's not to say that the loss of her children didn't affect her. It certainly did. And we read of periods where she went through incredible trauma and pain as a result of the grief she was experiencing. But it was simply her way of saying that even in the deepest loss, she found God's grace to be all sufficient. In fact, in another letter she wrote to one of her other sons, she said, There is none but Christ, none but Christ who is sufficient for all these things. Blessed be God, he is an all-sufficient saviour. Let us love him much, for we have been forgiven much. Samuel himself, the, the um, husband Samuel, for all of his faults and misgivings, realised what a wonderful mother Susanna had been. He once wrote this to his son John. He said, you know what you owe to the best of mothers? often reflect on the tender love she has always expressed to you and the deep affliction of body and mind she went through for you. Remember the pain and the pain she endured, educating you through her own ill health and above all the sweet and wholesome motherly advice she often gives you to fear God, to take care of your soul as well as to take care of your education, to shun sin and to shun bad examples. Do not forget to show your thanks by supporting her in old age, to show yourself not unworthy of such a mother. In short, revere and love her as much as you should. The more honour you pay and the more frequently 
and kindly you write to her, the more you will please your affectionate father. For all of the criticism of Samuel Wesley, there's some wise words there in the honour that we pay to our mothers and fathers and to the honour that we pay to those spiritual mothers and fathers who have uh, challenged us and given us good role models and the way that we support and look after them in their old age. Because the Bible reminds us one of the Ten Commandments is to honour our mothers and fathers and the words of Samuel Wesley has reflected on the tremendous example of his wife, though he himself did not honour her very well, to his sons to pay their mother great honour and affection. Remember Paul's words to Timothy. Paul says, I am reminded of the sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and then lived in your mother Eunice. And now I'm persuaded that same faith also lives in you. Paul could see the legacy of his mother and his of Timothy's mother and Timothy's grandmother's faith now being passed down to Timothy, that that legacy was now seen in him. See, a similar thing in Susanna's life. Her legacy is seen in the faith of her children, uh, notably in the faith of Charles Wesley and John Wesley, those great figures of, uh, of the 18th century in England. Through the faith of a godly mother, the landscape of England, of Christianity in England, was changed to the glory of God, that God used uh, that legacy. Many of uh, Susanna's qualities were passed on to her son, which is obviously natural. Um, you pass on qualities, whether you like it or not, to your children. But she also nurtured some of those great qualities and lived before her sons and daughters in such a way that they had a clear and uh, suitable and authentic role model for how they should live as godly men and women. We must ask ourselves what qualities we are passing on. We must challenge ourselves about the, um, the, uh, some of the qualities that we have, some of the weaknesses we have as Christians, not only because we must uh, strive for greater godliness, not only because we must overcome sin and temptation for our own Christian walk, but we must realise that the weaknesses that we have and the deficiencies in our role model, in our models that we are and the legacy that we are showing, we will pass on to the next generation if we are not careful. Susanna's health, which was never good, so I said before, went slowly downhill and in her 70s, she called her family to her bedside, realising that her end was near. John wrote, when he reflected on the bedside experience, the deathbed experience of Susanna, he said uh, her look was calm and serene and her eyes were fixed upwards to heaven. Then, without any struggle or sigh or groan, her soul was set at liberty. We then fulfilled the last request she gave us before losing her speech. The last words were, children, as soon as I am gone, sing a psalm of praise to God. Susanna was later buried and her tombstone, on her tombstone was written some words of a poem. I'll just read some of those words to you to just bring this to a close says this, in sure and steadfast hope to rise and claim her mansion in the skies, a Christian here her flesh laid down, the cross exchanging for a crown. Meet for the fellowship above, she heard the call, arise my love, I come, her dying looks replied, and lamb-like as her Lord she died. Hopefully some of the example of godly living and of, uh, of long-sightedness in terms of seeking to live out your life in such a way that it produces a legacy in those around you, in your children and in those who come after you, in those who look to you for a godly example is a great challenge for us as Christians. May inspire us, may inspire particularly some of the women in our church to think about how they can live lives
of, uh, of all godliness, whether they're called to motherhood, whether they're called to married life, whether they're called to singleness, whether they're called to serve God in whatever ways and whatever plans he has for them, to see their lives as inspiring a generation of young women to grow up as uh, strong and courageous and godly and humble and kind and compassionate women for the Lord, for the glory of his name. Should we just close in prayer? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you've set us godly examples. We thank you that, as Paul reminds us uh, in 1 Corinthians, he reminds us that we learn much by example. He says, I will follow Christ so that you may follow my example. Lord, we pray that as we follow Christ, we may set an example for others to follow, showing a Christ-like example by the way that we live, by the way that we speak, and by the way that we endure all things for your name and for your glory. Amen.